Good morning. Good to see you all here. And uh, we want to welcome those who are streaming the service as well. The uh, video you just saw is really the title of our Connect Groups this fall. Uh, the study is called Not a Fan. And, you know, there are fans, and um, then there are, there are those that are really committed, and they're followers. This study is all about being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus Christ. And the Connect Groups meet the first and third Sunday evenings in homes around the community. Um, we have the flyers, as Tiffany mentioned. They're out there in the lobby. I'd like you to make sure you pick one up and take a look at it. They, they tell you where these homes are at and uh, who the leaders are that are at each one of these houses. So uh, please pick one up today because as, as the uh, video said, you know, it seems like that we have churches that are filled with fans, but are we really followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? I expect, I expect this study to challenge me. I expect that it's going to challenge me in the area of how committed I am. What kind of disciple am I of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm looking forward to this study. Actually, there's a lot of stuff that, that's going to be available to you. There's a journal. This study is meant for, uh, I think, six, seven weeks and um, we are studying, as I said a moment ago, first and third. But there's a journal that you can get. We're going to have them available that you can follow that will really deepen your commitment and your level of discipleship. Of course, as, as usual, there's the Kids Connect group that will meet back in the fellowship hall and the Teens uh, Connect group that will meet here in the sanctuary as well as outside with their games and, and all of that. So if you've got a child, you can stop by at uh, 5.30, dropping them off, uh, and then on your way to that Connect group. I hope you will join us uh, at our Connect groups this fall, starting next Sunday. Well, today, we're continuing our series that uh, I've called Skewed, Does the Bible Really Say That? And so this morning, we're going to look at another misquoted or twisted, skewed scripture. How many of you have ever heard it said, money is the root of all evil? Come on, let me see your hand. You've heard it said, money is the root of all evil. Well, that's skewed, isn't it? It's twisted. Let's take a look at the text together. If you've got your smart device or your book-bound edition uh, of the Bible, or if you just want to follow along up here, I want you to get your eyes on the Word this morning, okay? 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. And so follow along with me as I read it, and then we'll pray. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, for the what? For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Pray with me. Father, thank you this morning for the word of God. Thank you, O oh God, for the truth that, Lord, has been revealed through the ages, O oh God. Lord, uh, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's so powerful, O oh God, that it is discerning between the joint and the marrow, the soul and the spirit. Thank you that word will penetrate us today. I thank you, Lord, for the sense of the anointing of God to proclaim, preach, and teach the word this morning. Not only, Lord, upon me, I thank you, O oh God, for what you're doing in our hearts and lives as you transform us, O oh God, to, to be like you in every way and everyone's said. So I want you to first of all to point out to you, and, and you've noted it already because I emphasize it, that the text does not say that money is the root of all evil. It says for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
So it's important to understand that money is morally neutral. Money is morally neutral. I wish I had a stack of $100 bills up here. You wish you had them too, right? Well, what I, what I just want to say is, is we can have this cash up here, and in and of itself, it's morally neutral. It is not good or bad. It's just neutral. It's not righteous or evil. It can be used for good or evil. And we determine how it's going to be used, don't we? As a matter of fact, some of you this morning took your money and you put it to a righteous cause. You, you said, I want this money to go to missions, or, or, or I want this money to help the church to proclaim the gospel here in Grand Prairie and around the world. So, so you determine the direction of your money, whether it is used for good or evil. You see, throughout the Bible, both the impoverished and the wealthy are considered godly. Note that. Both the impoverished as well as the wealthy are considered godly. We, most of us know that Abraham and Lot were very wealthy men. As a matter of fact, Job very well could have been the wealthiest person on the planet during his lifetime. But the Bible makes it clear that Job was a godly man. When he lost everything, God even replaced it twofold, gave it back to him. And in fact, sometimes those who are materially blessed like Job are blessed by God with the power to carry out God's work. Clearly, God does not equate money as being evil. Let me show you what I mean here a little bit further. We, we know that God's not a man that he should lie, and God won't say one thing and then do something different. So I, I want to ask this question. If money is in of itself evil, if money is evil, then why does the biblical text say this in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18? It says to us, But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant. We could, we could paraphrase that there. It is he who gives you the ability to produce or to earn money and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. That's Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. Or how about Psalms? Psalms 1, verses 1 through 3. When God says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now catch verse 3. Verse 3 says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now, I, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel to you. I do believe that God, God wants to bless us and help us, but I don't believe that every one of us are destined to be millionaires or gazillionaires or billionaires. I don't think it's saying this, but I think God wants to bless you. God wants to help you. God, God wants to encourage you spiritually, uh, mentally, physically, and financially. But I want you to see here that it's not money that's the problem. And we'll see what the problem is for a moment. One more scripture. It's Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It says, do not let the law, the book of the law, depart from your mouth, meditate it on it day and night so that you'll be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Here's the whole point. God doesn't equate money to being evil. Money's a necessary thing in our lives, isn't it? I, the, the scripture in verse 8 says, you know, food, clothing, and implied there is shelter, and so we've got to have money for food, clothing, and shelter. So the problem is not money, but catch this, the problem is my attitude towards money. What is my attitude towards money? 
You know, money, the desire of it's got to be managed. The question I need to ask in myself is, do I control money or does money control me? Paul warns that if our desire, our craving for money is not managed or tamped down and, and not allowed to control us, then what will happen is we'll do anything to get it or gain it. And he says, if you'll do anything to get or gain money, this is a trap. If you'll do it or... Uh, do anything to get it or gain it, it has the potential of ruin and destruction. You know, the love of money has ruined marriages. The love of money has ruined families. The love of money has destroyed and killed people physically. Paul says, that's a foolish way to live. You know, I came across a story that just, uh, it's a very famous person that relates this story in, in my prep for this message, and it shows the lack of managing the desire for money. She said, when I was 13 years old, my dad owned his own business. It was a tiny shack where he sold chicken, ribs, hamburgers, hot dogs, and fries. I could use some of that right now, couldn't you? She said, one day, the oil in that chicken the oil that the chicken was fried in caught fire, and in a few minutes, the whole shack was exploding in flames. My dad had been inside, and he bolted out of the shack, and he bolted out of that store before the flames could engulf him. She said, when my mom and I arrived, we were standing there on the scene, and we stood there with dad, watching his business just burning up, when all of a sudden, she said, my dad realized that he had left the money in the metal cash register inside the building. She said, I watched in disbelief as he ran back into the inferno before anyone could stop him. He tried to open the metal cash register, but the heat was already affecting the mechanism of that. The intense heat had already sealed that drawer shut some way. And knowing that every penny that he had was locked up in front of him, was about to burn up in the flames, he picked the scalding metal box up and carried it outside. When he threw the cash register down on the ground, the skin on his chest and his arms went with it. That's how hot it was. He had voluntarily risked his life and was severely injured. That money was that important. Now here's the phrase that just gives me pause. This lady says, it was then that I learned that money is obviously more important than life itself. From that point on, earning money, lots of money, not only became what drove me professionally, but it also became my emotional priority. Susie Ortman is the one who writes that. You see, it smacks to me of the love of money, that I would risk everything and anything to gain it and to have it. You know, plainly the Bible doesn't say that money is, but it is the love of money. So let's, let's look at this. And, and, and the love of money, as, as I've already alluded to, speaks to my attitude about money. Now, one of the interesting things that I tend to do with couples who come to me for premarital coaching before they're going to get married is that when we begin to talk about finances and putting a budget together and all of that, I, I, I try to remember to always ask, if you could say, give one word to money that would ascribe how you feel about it, and I'll give them an example, you know, would you say money is power? Would you say money is influence? Would you say that money is just a means of exchange? What one word would you ascribe to money? 
Now, I'm not going to ask you to answer that out loud this morning, but I want you to think about that for a moment. What one word or phrase would you use to describe what money is to you? And the truth is this, that usually the family that we grew up in and the dynamic that we lived with in regard to money has the greatest influence upon us and really almost is the determining factor, not always, but almost is the determining factor in how we view money or as I'm saying in this message, what our attitude about money is. Now, the key to this verse, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, can be missed when we don't uncover the root of the love of money. Because make no mistake, the root of the love, love of money is covetousness. You know, it's a desire. Now, now covetousness, can, you, can, you can covet money. You can eagerly desire it, covet it. But obviously, covet, coveting something could be money or someone or something or somewhere that God hasn't granted and, and blessed you with. And, you know, covetousness is a, a, a lust for, an appetite for anything apart from satisfaction of God. That's why God has told us not to covet. Because when we covet, we take whatever that thing is, whether it's money, whether it's a person, whether it's uh, an automobile, whether it's whatever it is, when we covet that, we take that thing and we put it in the first place, even above God himself. And that's a dangerous thing. So I submit to you that my attitude about money that Paul is alluding to here when he says the love or the eager desire for money is really a barometer. My attitude about money is a barometer. It, it, it shows where my heart is. It shows my spiritual condition. You've heard me say this before, and you've heard it before, too. You know, Jesus talked a, a whole lot about wealth and money and possessions and all of those things because, although he didn't use the words, because he knew that our view of it, our, our quest for it, is a barometer spiritually of our heart. Well, let's look at one of the times where Jesus was talking about money and trying to teach us something. You remember the story of the rich young ruler. Many of you do, I'm sure. It's found in Matthew chapter 19. It's one of the more famous dialogues that Jesus had with people in regard to money. And, and, and the rich young ruler, he comes to Jesus. I, I don't know where Jesus was at at that point, but it seems like as you read Matthew chapter 19, this rich young ruler makes his way through the crowd, and he finally comes up to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, please tell me what I must do I think one translation says inherit, another says obtain. What I must do to obtain eternal life. Now, I believe that Jesus was very discerning. I, I believe, you know, all the gifts of the Spirit were in operation in his life, aside from the fact that he was fully God and fully man. And he really could look at this rich young ruler and see beyond the surface and see his heart. And he said to him, I believe he says this on purpose. He says to him, keep all of the commandments. And so the young man kind of just, rich young ruler, kind of, puffs his chest out and says, Lord, I've already done that. Check that. I've done that. I've kept the commandments. Now, remember, Jesus is seeing his heart. He, he's got a barometer that he's measuring with. And I believe that the next thing that Jesus said was to test whether he was willing to keep the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And so he says to this young man, in trying to reveal his heart, okay, 
Then do this. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That's the message. To, no, that's not the message today. I'm not telling you to sell all you have and give it to the poor. And that isn't really Jesus' point here. Here's Jesus' point. Because we see the reaction of this rich young ruler. He drops his head and he turns around and he walks off. He walks off. And they're looking at him and seeing him walk away. And Jesus has taken and pointed to the fact that his love of his wealth, his money, was his master. It had become his idol. It would, he could not let go of it because it would not let go of him, his attitude towards his money. You know, there's three questions I'm asking myself in this message. Perhaps you would like to ask these questions yourself as well. The first question that I, is I look at and, and try to read the barometer of my life in regard to money is, am I always telling myself that I would be content if I just had whatever it is? If I just had a MacBook, if I just had, I, I got to tell you, I, I, you know, I kind of like technology and gadgets and stuff like that, you know. If I could just have one of those locks that I put on my front door that I can control with my smartphone so I don't have to get up out of my chair and let somebody in. Duh. You know, that's kind of silly. But, but do you get my point? If I just had this, or if I just had this kind of car, just had this kind of house, it's a barometer. You see, content with something, and there's nothing wrong with advancement. The problem becomes when our contentment isn't in God himself. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, I will never lead you or forsake you. The second question I'm asking myself in regard to the spiritual barometer of my life and money is, am I trusting in money as my refuge? Is money my shelter? Is money my safe haven to get me through? Now, now uh, be, be sure to look here at this. You know, we've got to look at the context of the whole. There's nothing wrong with saving for the future. Hello? I mean, the Bible teaches us that. The Bible teaches us that we ought to save and that we ought to, to uh, be good stewards of what God gives us and all that. Here is the point with this. The point of this is that if I am trusting in money alone and my shelter and refuge is not in God, then I put in the wrong priority. And the barometer shows that wealth or riches or money is what I'm trusting in. Psalms 52, 7 through 8. One more, one more question as a barometer I'm asking myself in regard to my spiritual condition as I look at money. The last question is, do I find it hard to let go of my money when others are in need and I can help other people? 1 John 3, 17 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with action and in truth. As I close, I want us to go back to the rich young ruler for a moment. After his encounter with this rich young ruler and he bowed his head and he walked off, Jesus says these words. He says, truly, truly I tell you, 
With great difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this is a hard saying, especially for us 21st century American Christians. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. You don't put me in that because I'm not rich. Well, really? Did you know that the majority of us Americans earn an annual salary that puts us in the top 1% of the world's wealth? No, I'm not talking about those people that, you know, those one percenters in America. I'm talking about when we compare ourselves to the entire world, we, if, if we are earning uh, over $34,000 a year, if we think this is saying that rich people will never enter the kingdom of God, that means that most of us in this room are never going to make it to heaven. Is that what Jesus is saying? No. You see, what Jesus is clearly teaching here is when he says... This is that God's grace is what will take us to heaven. The reality of this verse is Jesus is calling out the majority stumbling block for anyone who thinks they can get to heaven by their own works, by their own wealth. If we stop reading there, we miss the whole point because we continue down to verses 26 and 27. We understand that he says the disciples were like, what? If, if that's the case, who can be saved then? It's exactly what they say, verse 26 and 27. And Jesus said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Man on his own, it's impossible for him to make it. The passage doesn't condemn money or wealth. It's Jesus' way of letting us know that no one gets to heaven by what they own or have, but by grace alone. <laughs> and then don't miss just a handful of scriptures later tied to the text. Remember, we're talking about when we look at twisted scripture, we talk about context. In the context of this, as we go out just a few more scriptures, we find that Jesus is walking along, and as he's walking along, he comes to a group of trees, and up there in the tree, he looks up, and there's a man that's up in the tree who's climbed up there because he wanted to see Jesus. He'd heard about Jesus, and he climbs up in the tree, and he's up there. This is a man who's short in stature, but he is a crooked tax collector. Now, don't miss. Not everybody that works for the IRS is crooked, okay? Don't misinterpret Scripture. Don't take it out of context. But something happens. What's impossible for men is possible with God. Something happens between, I don't know, the 8, 12 feet that Zacchaeus is up in the tree. By the time he makes it to the ground, the impossible thing with men is the possibility with God. And there is a transformation that happens in Zacchaeus' heart. No longer is he a lover of money, eager to get rich. Because when his feet hit the ground, grace has transformed him. And he says, God, what I have stolen, I will give give back to them four times what I've taken. Grace. The power of grace. It was grace that will help us keep our attitudes right about money. It is grace that makes us sons and daughters of God and nothing else. Would you stand together with me, please? Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the power of the word.